Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Therapist Uncensored. This is a podcast that breaks down interpersonal science into practical and understandable tidbits. And as you listen, I can just imagine little light bulbs of insight appearing above your head. You're going to be surprised and touched at what you learn about yourself as you get more accurate and in-depth view of your mind and your heart and as you figure out those close to you. Therapist Uncensored brings you decades of experience with interpersonal psychotherapy, relational neuroscience, modern attachment, and anything else they think will be helpful in healing humans. Now, here are your co-hosts, Dr. Ann Kelly and Sue Marriott. Hey, everybody. This is a very special episode to Sue and I. We want to grow, build, develop security in your bodies and our bodies, and we do that through bonding. We do that through connection. You hear that if you're a longtime listener, you know that that's our mojo. And today we're going to be talking about ways we can do that in a very active way. And you can create a bonding experience and the neuropeptides that it induces in your body in your very own home. Right, Sue? <laughs> That's right. Uh, it makes me think of that book that you want to write called How to Be Your Own Drug Dealer. Basically, it's consciously manipulating oxytocin, which is our favorite neuropeptide, through the use of beloved pets. And there's a lot of important things that a pet can induce in you. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so there's been a lot of you. I'm sure many of you have seen it in some of the local press or the national press, the popular press. You know, they've sort of proven that your dog loves you and you love your dog, that it activates the reward center in both of you. So that part is probably not very new. Right. Well, I think what is new is being able to actually prove it, being able to measure reduction in cortisol levels and increase in oxytocin levels with deep eye contact with your animal. That's right. So oxytocin, they have called it the cuddle drug, the love drug, the moral molecule. <laughs> Anything reduced can be overly simplified. But we assure you, this really is a good one that you do want to promote for your well-being and for people's that are close to you, their well-being as well. So this isn't just getting animals to get us to feel oxytocin. It really is a relationship that goes back and forth. And we feed on each other from that perspective. No, that's really important because the research I love, and you can tell a lot of the research has been done by dog lovers or animal lovers because they're also interested in how that relationship impacts the animal. You know, we do know that the bonding, especially the high eye contact made specifically, let's talk about dogs, although this is relevant for animals. They've even shown positive outcome with fish, believe it or not. But with a dog, uh, the humans, cortisol level will go down, but the oxytocin level can go up almost 300% with the eye contact. But guess what? The dog, depending on the breed, goes up as well. And you just mentioned fish, and it gave me pause for a minute because I'm like, I don't know how you can get much eye contact with a fish. <laughs> but when I actually think about it, it probably, I think as you go down the evolutionary chain related to you know vertebrates and reptiles and stuff like that, I don't know so much that the pet gains the oxytocin as the owner, but it's not as powerful as an effect as some particular kinds of breeds of dogs with their loving partners. I don't even want to say masters or owners, you know what I mean, with their people. Yes. yes. And the reason I went back to fish is because I was thinking about my mother. One of the things that she does in her time these days is she waits for her time to go feed her fish in the fish pond. <laughs> and she talks to them and they all have names and she cleans up around. You know what I mean? It's a very active, loving relationship. It's the act of caring. And that's part of when they've done some of the work on it is the act of caring and the routine of nurturing something that is actually giving us something. Yeah, think of uh, two monkeys grooming. Right. That really will turn it on. And so many people like, for example, I know one teenager who wishes she had lice because she loves the feeling of someone picking through her hair. <laughs> so that's grooming, bonding. And my guess there is, that, again, that oxytocin is released through the grooming. For all of you out there that have animals, you can probably really relate to coming home to them and they're waiting for you and anticipating. I know for me, I really anticipate coming in and being welcome no matter how bad 
my day is. So we could go on and on and talk about it from a science perspective. But truthfully, there's so much meaning in being with our animals. There's so much deep resonance with it. So I think the heartfelt part is what's really important here. And Sue, would you share, you have a really important story having to do with Anne. Would you share your story? Oh boy. (laughs) So I'm going to try to do that. And this is a story that I know echoes across many, many millions of people because anybody who has loved an animal has a story. One thing before I get going on it is that people message me the most on a post, a post that I had put up on Facebook about a photographer who captured the last moments of people euthanizing their beloved dog. And it was so painful. And again, so many people resonated with it, but also there was some pushback of like, don't put that in front of me. Like it was so traumatic to even see it. So that's how powerful that body to body experience can be. Yeah. I couldn't even look at the picture. Right. I was, I was one of the, oh. right, right, right. So this is not a morbid story. Like, I mean, it's not morbid, but it is directly related to our topic today. Okay. So I've always been a dog person and have said that dogs have raised me in some ways, that they have been such a consistent, benevolent, reliable, caring, protective force. And if you notice that all of those terms are all related to attachment and security. So I would say nobody can tell us that they aren't as powerful, sometimes more powerful than our human connections. Not for everybody, certainly, but they've always played a big role for me. So this leads up to the story I'm going to share with you that does go back to the topic today about this chemical bond, really. So one day I was walking with my son. I hadn't seen him in a little while. He's a teenager. We've got two dogs. And here's a parenting trick. If you want to connect with your teenage kids, do something. If you sit across the table with them, they probably won't say much. But if you do some sort of project like walking dogs, then we're looking straight ahead. And sure enough, it's like clockwork. He will open up. And so he was telling me all this really lovely stuff about a girl that liked him. And now he knows that she likes him. And it was really touching because this is a 16-year-old boy now opening up to his mom. And the sun was setting, literally. And he looks up. I know that he used to go to this one location. That was his sort of private spot, thinking spot. And so he said, hey, do you want to go up there? And I was so touched. I was like, oh my gosh, I get to go to your private thinking spot. It's at the top of this little facility. It's it's basically is a parking garage. (laughs) But he was able to kind of sneak in there. There would be nobody there. And he would hang out up there and look at the city. So he invited me to go to a spot. So we've got the dogs, we go up there and it is like one of my highlights where he's opening up to me, he's sharing his spot, all these things happen. And I will just suffice it to say that a tragedy happened up there with my beloved (laughs) two-year-old dog. Uh, His name was Jackson. Basically he died very uh, tragically and suddenly that same night. So this is still hard to talk about. This has been a year and a half ago. But one of the things that, you know, I have to recover, I have to take care of him. I have a lot of responsibilities. I know enough about the brain. So I'm like, okay, this is traumatic. What do I do? What can I do to take care of myself? And this is at a time when this dog would ride back and forth with me to a nearby city where I would take care of family that is critically ill. So not only did I just learn about that, about this critical illness, but I also then lost this beloved two-year-old golden doodle named Jackson. So the very next day, I have no idea what to do to recover from this. And I'm on my way to Houston is actually where I'm driving. And I'm like, I don't even know that I can do it. And so (laughs) this isn't good. But even in the car, I start looking for another dog. And I'm feeling really guilty because I don't, you can't really replace a beloved animal. But this, again, gets us back to the point of this episode, which is I knew that I needed that kind, that source of support and care for me to ride with me in the car to, you know, the soft fur, all the good things that it's associated with. And I was really torn about like, this is really sick. It's almost like taxidermy (laughs) because I was looking for another golden doodle. I went back and forth, went back and forth, ended up finding a litter that those dogs were born on the day that Jackson died. Actually, they had just been born. This had just happened. 
And I find my person again, I always call Jackson my person. Part of why I'm wanting to share this is like, I know, like, it's not healthy. What, what I did wasn't healthy. But I literally thought I'm going to go purchase some oxytocin. <laughs> because I really need it. So go ahead and you can judge if you would like to. It's better than crack. And it's <laughs> better than a lot of things that people can do. But I really needed that experience. And it has turned out have a new dog now. His name is Cooper. And Cooper is incredible. I didn't have any problems bonding with him. He had no problems bonding. And I just think that Jackson would want me to have Cooper in my life. So I feel as close or closer now to Cooper. And I really actively use him as a source of comfort and companionship on these drives. And it's really made a huge difference for me. So this is half confession, half story of being able to manipulate, and it totally worked. The oxytocin flowed. I was really scared I wouldn't be able to bond, but we're going to keep describing the things that turn on the oxytocin and the bonding and the social connection, but it worked. And one last thing I want to say about this, towards the end, I may give a little bit more detail for those of you that want to hang around for that, but... It's not that I wasn't using people. I have a lot of supportive people in my life and had an outpouring of care and comfort. So it's not that I was deprived in that way in any way, but there was something unique about the connection that I had with Jackson in particular, and then later Cooper, that was different in some ways better than in some ways, obviously we need people, but that's how powerful of a bond that it is that it can make. And that's how healing and therapeutic it can be that I put it on that level. It's such a meaningful, beautiful story. And we, especially at that time of the life, finding out about the critical illness of your family member and how painful that was, those drives and how important, and you knew you needed that it's a different kind of support. You can have people bringing you dinner and calling you and loving you, but somebody that sits holding you and everything. Yes. But having somebody that sits on your lap during those drives, you knew you needed it. It was a very difficult time in your life. And to have that major of a loss was just overwhelming. And honestly, you needed a new dog to help you get over Jackson, not not replace him. It wasn't to replace it. So you needed that soothing and that loving and uh, the connection that Cooper gave you and uh, to anticipate his arrival six weeks later. And so I think it's a beautiful story. And I think it helps. I think everybody can relate to it. And I appreciate, you know, especially your vulnerability of saying, yes, people can judge you for not waiting and getting over Jackson before you got a new pup. That wasn't a time in your life you could do that. You were at a time in your life you needed that oxytocin. You needed that connection and you knew you needed it right then. And I think it's a really touching story and I think a lot of people can relate to it. Yeah. So taxidermy aside, um, (laughs) it was very effective. And again, I'm imagining everybody listening or most people listening have some kind of story have been impacted in some way by what, even if it's a family member, but well, as pets as family members. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things we know, we're moving more back into the science of it is that it really is species dependent. Well, first of all, the cool news, new thing that they have been able to prove is that this oxytocin does bounce across species. That's what Anne was talking about just a moment ago. Right. That is not just with humans. Yeah. It bounces across species into different, and any, any picture that you've ever seen, even of chimpanzees holding each other. One of my favorite pictures is a, of a dog with a cat rolled up into the collar. You might've seen that those Elizabethan collars and there's a dog laying there and a little kitty rolled up and just the kind of connection that animals can bring to one another and to humans is amazing. That's right. And so the mechanism for that is this neuropeptide called oxytocin. It is normally associated with childbirth and with nursing and lovemaking, orgasm. But everybody produces it. Men and women both produce it. And the idea is let's cultivate it more in our lives because that's what makes us get that feeling of open heartedness, of bonding, of connection. And here's another just quick story. After I had my first son, I was back at work and when people would do a certain distress signal where I could feel their pain, I could feel in my chest like my milk let down. (laughs) So it was an oxytocin 
flash. It was like response. a little, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, it was an oxytocin response. And still, it doesn't feel exactly like that, but I can feel there's a certain opening that happens when you see someone with genuine tears that basically does the distress signal that basically it's calling for nurturance. Right. And animals pick up that and animals will pick up your distress. And anyone that has an animal, uh, cats will pick it up, but dogs definitely pick it up where they feel your distress and they come actively to you and want to nurture you and vice versa. And when you're petting your dog or your cat and you can see how much they're loving it and enjoying it and that you're bringing them a bond that is having a chemical response to you. It's amazing. Yeah, it really is. I know that I'm getting into the science of it, but literally there's so many studies around how it can actually lower blood pressure. It decreases loneliness. There's having individuals that have had heart attacks, have animals around, increases their longevity and their healing. So there's active healing aspects to it too. Oxytocin sometimes can be misunderstood as just all good. Like I used to joke about, you know, we need to spike the city water well with some oxytocin. <laughs> everybody would get along, everybody fall in love with each other, you know, like everything, there's not one answer. One thing that can happen with increased oxytocin is more tribalism, envy, it can make people more aggressive in a protective way. So it's not just a panacea by any stretch, but it is very high. It's a wonderful, wonderful drug that you want to learn how to produce and learn how to produce in others. So how do we do it with people? How do we really facilitate oxytocin flow with people? Well, one of the major sources is the idea of building trust. The more that you can feel a trust in somebody, and while this is related to dogs, the interesting thing is they've even shown that when you are out walking and you run into somebody that has dogs, your trust of them is actually higher than if they don't have it. And so you're more likely to make a connection, a wave or a stop. So building trust in people in general, but even with animals, if anybody's been to a dog park, you know that you're going to know each other's dog's names and probably not the people, <laughs> but that you're going to go and you're going to converse and you're going to have this commonality. So it's a really wonderful avenue for connection, but building trust with people. Right. And the big, big, big one is eye contact. So Mm -hmm. gaze is one of the mediators for sure. And so if two human beings gaze at each other very long, something powerful is going to happen. You know, that's a soft gaze. I was going to say, you're going to fight, you're going to make out something, (laughs) something is going to happen. That's how powerful it is. And what the research is showing, and this is what's been recent in the popular press, is that there's a few conditions. One, if you catch your dog looking at you, so they're already looking at you and you catch them, that gives you this big bump of oxytocin, which is really cool. But then also, if you just, if you go and you get your dog's attention and you can just gaze with your dog, that is the thing that turns on the oxytocin. And what Anne was talking about earlier, I can't remember, did you give the actual numbers of the percentages? I don't know that I did, that at least in this one, that that it could increase the human's oxytocin 300% with the eye gaze and the dog's about 160% just from a short period of time of eye gazing and connection with the animal. And what's interesting about that is different for different breeds. That exa- It's not just sitting there with a dog. In fact, some breeds that don't do the eye contact, that are more service and not about the connection, that those owners and dogs don't necessarily have the oxytocin go up. There's, so there's certain breeds that will increase more than others. Yeah, I remember the study where that they actually trained dogs to go into an MRI machine? That's so interesting. Yes, it was. It's fascinating. And we'll link it in the show notes. They go through like a two month period of training where they are kept perfectly still and they put earphones on them so that because in an MRI machine, if you've had one that's so loud, (laughs) bang, 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 all these uh, magnets and everything. But these dogs, you know, acclimated to it and they're fine. They're happy. This isn't a misuse of animal research. But what they were looking at was they would give hand signals to the dog and you know, it's related to hot dogs. (laughs) You get the hot dog or you don't get the hot dog. And the reward center of the dog's brain would light up. And it's very associated with where our reward center. So any of you out there that are worried about, what do you call it? Anthropizing? Anthrom? You guys know what I'm trying to say. Basically, humans attributing human conditions and characteristics to animals. Right. that's, That's always a risk. But what basically these researchers are saying now is, no, that's not happening. We can actually see what's happening. And there are these very high correlations, 
you know, we might have different language for it or what have you, but brains are too similar. A dog's brain is about the size of a plum, or maybe if it's a big dog, a lemon. Most of their head is muscle. What's more interesting is that there's a lot of similar anatomy between a human brain and a dog brain. So that's why that we can begin to infer as their reward center lights up and our reward center lights up, that it's probably a very similar experience because we can actually see it happening. We can see it turn off when the hot dog goes away. You know what I mean? I mean, it's very manipulatable. But the interesting twist they did to the study was they had different people do the hand signals. So for some dogs, and this goes back to your point, Anne, uh, that it really depends on the breed. So for some dogs, they would have a higher spike of the reward center when it was a stranger that gave this signal. Or a computer. Or even a computer. So this proves two things. It proves that it's not just about getting the hot dog. It's the signal itself. And this is the cool part. This is really what I wanted to get to, is that dogs hold a representation of you, of their owners, of, of their people inside them, even when they're not there. Right. The smell would activate the dogs, even when the, again, we don't want to get away from the owner. When the, when the dog's person. When the dog's person <laughs> <laughs> was not there, that the smell would still activate the reward. The smell of their person right. would activate the reward center when the person was not home. So they had this anticipation of this person held in them. So they do remember you when you're not home. It's not just out of sight, out of mind. That's an important It's element. really, it's so sweet. And, and they distinguish certain breeds, really distinguish that when their owner was the one giving them, definitely a deep light up as opposed to somebody else. So the, the, the connection and that now I don't know about all the different types of breeds in this study. Do you about well, which they, breeds? I was listening very closely and for sure they mentioned Labradors, they mentioned golden retrievers. To me, it feels a little intuitive that there's some of these dogs that are just so like therapy dogs versus the researcher himself had a dog that was uh, kind of a mutt dog, beautiful, loved him incredibly, but didn't have that same wiring that human to dog wiring in the exact same way. So in other words, when a stranger came and gave it, there was more interest because something new was happening. So it lit up, but it was less about the bond with the person. Right. It was more about the hot dog. <laughs> Many of you probably have dogs that are more about the hot dog than the people, you know, <laughs> or more about the ball, the ball, the ball, the ball. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas you, you have seen and probably experienced animals that just stare at you. You know, right. I think of standard poodles, of course. And those are the ones that are going to be a little bit more. Uh, and I, well, you know what I wonder about, Anne, is like chihuahuas and things that are highly bonded to one person. In some ways, we were just talking about oxytocin and bonding. Like, do they have higher oxytocin? And then that's why they're more tribal <laughs> and protective ah, of their per people. That's an interesting thought, I know, but there are certain dogs that are better service dogs and certain dogs that are better therapy dogs. And those are different because a service dog is somebody that usually is related to this one act that had been trained very well with their one owner. And a therapy dog has definitely usually been trained to be able to engage with lots of individuals in lots of different situations. But you see out there the importance. I have a, a friend that had a therapy dog that they brought in. She's an attorney and they bring this animal in to sit and let kids that are testifying that they've shown all these results about letting them pet these animals while they're testifying and how it reduces their cortisol level and allows them to feel safer. And again, what we talk about, build trust to be able to engage in this really difficult situation of testifying sometimes against people that they love. And I imagine there are many of you that have pets other than dogs. I'm thinking about even equine therapy, working with horses. And I bet you the list goes on and on. You know what I right. mean? Uh, I wonder, you know, what the cat people out there might be saying and <laughs> the reptile people and the horse people. We were focusing on dogs because that's where the research is. And certainly I can identify so deeply about that in particular. But there is no doubt. And you all are the expert on that, on you and your animal or you and your pet you know what's real and what's not real. So what we're doing is we're really validating for you the power of it. Also, those of you that have reached out and said that you're pretty isolated or that you're alone. Also, if you have a child that is, there's a lot of research on this, even with the people on the spectrum and autism. That one of the first things that you want to do is get your child a very, very social dog. And especially kids with autism, it can be a safer connection and they can work with the social engagement of an animal. It's less intense than the eye contact of a human being. 
Yeah, no, that's a really, really good point. And, and you know, one thing we've been emphasizing actually is the neurochemical oxytocin, but we haven't actually, and I, and, and one of the studies, honestly, that I think even the MRI state that we referenced, there was a lot of activation of dopamine, which is a motivator and a connector and a trust builder. So it's really important. I know we've been hammering the oxytocin, but dopamine is also really important in the effects that we're speaking of. Yeah, the way I think of it is, you know, dopamine is the hunt and find, you know, like looking for one another, looking for a date, that kind of thing. But when you add the oxytocin, once you find the thing you're looking for, <laughs> you better like it a whole lot or else right. dopamine is just going to have you running looking all the time. <laughs> and so the combination of dopamine and oxytocin is awesome from a romantic standpoint. <laughs> good point. Good point. Oh my God, we're such nerds. <laughs> All right. If you've stuck with us through this whole episode, then I consider you a little bit closer in in my circle. And I'm going to share a little bit more detail of that story because a lot of people, when they hear it, they want to know what happened. So going back, Jackson, Keeley is uh, the other dog that was there. My son and I are on top of the parking garage and it's huge and it's fenced in. Where we were standing, there's a um, chain link fence it's in two parts kind of, right? There's the part that goes up and then the part. Anyway, half of it wasn't fenced, but where we were standing was fenced and it's huge. You can imagine a big parking lot with a wall that goes up to your, what, your head? No, it went up to your shoulders just about. Yeah. So let's just say at least chest encircled it. What ended up happening is that I let the dog off the leash he stays with me all the time. He had stayed with me all the time. He wasn't a dog that ran away at all, like even feet. And they began to play. And he jumped, like he can jump on my son's trampoline very easily, like a little goat. So he didn't realize that he was high up. And so in there, gentle playing back and forth, he jumped. And that's what happened is he ended up jumping off of this top of this parking garage over a high fence. I'm saying this to defend myself because I still feel so terrible about it. It was so traumatic. But he didn't know. You know, he, he was a jumper. He could jump. There's no way he would have known that there wasn't something on the other side. And I have to tell myself there's no way I would have known that he would have jumped on this half acre, practically, huge parking garage with me up there, with him standing next to me, that he's any way possible that he would have gone over that ledge. So I'm sorry for the very painful ending there. This is us just trying to really walk the walk and be vulnerable with you mm -hmm. in the same way that we're asking you to be vulnerable with the close people to you. Yeah, so I really appreciate uh, that. Cheers to Jackson. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, I will continue for years working on my guilt about this, of course. Another quick side note, my son had no guilt. This was a little bit later, but he was like, Mom, you couldn't have possibly known that. You know, this was just a freak accident. I mean, he had no responsibility at all. And I could imagine some world, since he was the one that brought us up there and stuff, he shouldn't have felt bad about it. But I'm like, oh, that's what security looks like. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's sort of this health robust resilience. It's like he was heartbroken, but he didn't do that, you know. So that, I, that was another little side lesson for me of these accidents and tragedies happen. I certainly would never do it again, you know, leave any kind of risk like that to happen. So there you go. I hope. And it's left trauma in your body that Absolutely. you've been working on healing. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it took me a very long time to even see that parking mm -hmm. garage. Or it's right in our neighborhood. I would avoid it. And that's mm -hmm. one of those classic things of trauma is you avoid things. So in me telling the story so publicly, again, this is part of me putting it together, making a coherent narrative <laughs> and mm -hmm. holding myself accountable, but also with a lot of compassion. Like mm -hmm. obviously I would have never harmed that animal. I would have given anything to protect Jackson. So there you go. That was very brave and courageous to share the story with the listeners because that's a very vulnerable story it for is. you. It is. I would not have been able to do it before very no. long, you know. But. No, but that's you walking the walk. You're yep. Sharing yep. your vulnerability because we've all had those things that we've done that when we replay it in our mind, we could just say, oh, if we'd only, if we'd only. And we all have those and it's the most painful thing to go through. But one of the ways to do it is to tell the story and to talk about it and to move on with the healing and Cooper has been a big part of your healing. Yeah. So how about we post uh, some pictures of Cooper and Jackson? I think it's a thing. great idea. <laughs> so you'll get to see their sweet little faces. 
Okay. Thank you so much for listening all the way through. We hope that this finds you with open heart and with motivation to continue to grow your social relationships across species and also definitely with people in your life. To think about the resources that you have at your hand right now, if you know deeply that you probably need, just like Sue was talking about, a little bit more healing and connection in your life right now. All right. If you're feeling like you're getting something from the podcast, please consider supporting us. It helps us. We still are upside down. We're in the red. Uh, We aren't even covering our expenses yet, but you could help us out at patreon.com backslash therapist uncensored. Basically you become kind of a co-producer and you help us put the show on and be able to focus on more content and getting it out there as far as possible. So I love what Anne always says of uh, we're building security one episode at a time. (laughs) So that's a good mission to put your money behind. Absolutely. All right. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you around the bend. Hey, everybody. Thank you for listening all the way through. But before you hit stop, this is really important. We want to appeal to you to, if you like this content, please consider joining us at Patreon. And basically what that means is even for just a dollar a month or $5 a month or $10 a month or $25 a month, it doesn't matter. All really is super valued. And we're looking for a hundred supporters by our hundredth episode. And we are very close. We're only need 35 more people to go and we've got a couple episodes left so please consider if you haven't yet going to patreon.com backslash therapist uncensored in the meantime we want to thank because we shout out everybody that joins us one of the things you'll get is shout out on the air and then based on your tiers the benefits change but if you do join right now during this push for the 100th episode, you're also going to get a couple of other little perks. Also, by the way, if you're already a patron member and you upgrade, you'll also get these perks. Basically what that means is you'll get a couple of custom stickers. You just need to send us your address and all the new handouts that we've done. We've uh, been creating some new cool stuff and we make really great visuals, infographics kind of thing. And you'll get all of those because we want to just spread the good news. In the meantime, I would like to thank our new co-executive producer, Platinum Neuro Nerd, Isaac Marsalik. Thank you so much. We've also got some gold neuro nerds, Catherine Underwood, Edward B. Jenny, Monica Linker, Kara Brennan, Louise McDermott, Judy Kamara, Margot Timble, and Camille Scent. Thank you so much. You'll see all of these people that I just listed on our website this is one of the benefits that you get is you'll be thanked on air also on our website and if you would like to link that to your own page that you're welcome to also we've got some other excellent supporters that we couldn't do it without these are neuro nerds that we want to welcome to the community Carla Husher Kristen Van Engelen Brooke Farrell and Sally Stacy thank you thank you thank you And again, if you haven't joined us, please be one of these 35 people that we need at patreon.com backslash therapist uncensored or therapist uncensored.com. You'll see it at the bottom of the page. So join, or if you're already a member upgrade, if you do either of those two things, you will get these little special offers. And this is all a push to get us to a hundred patrons by the hundredth episode. Okay. Thank you so much for listening. And we will talk again soon. Therapist Uncensored is Ann Kelly and Sue Marriott. This podcast is edited by Jack Anderson.